You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Have you ever wondered about church unity post World War II? Well, if you're looking for a podcast with all the answers about today's ecumenical issues that's going to help you better understand your faith, then you've come exactly to the wrong place. But if you're looking for a show that will ask questions that struggle with differing opinion from smart theologians, it's going to leave you completely clueless. Then you found the perfect show for you. This is a show designed to give you more questions than answers. I'm Joshua Knoll, and I am just a dummy who loves God and theology and hopes to show my love for God by studying and thinking deeply about topics people smarter than me have been thinking about for thousands of years. Today, we're mostly going to be focusing on one that's only a few decades old. Um, the issue is much longer, but we're going to be talking about a debate that had between Martin Lloyd-Jones and John Stott in the 1960s at a very important ecumenical debate, ecumenical council. Um, if you don't know, ecumenical work just refers to the work of church unity. Pretty, pretty simple, just church unity. But John Stott invited Martin Lloyd-Jones at the National Assembly of Evangelicals in 1966. And Martin Lloyd-Jones suggests that everybody should just get the crap out of the church. Start over. And John Stott uh, made a pretty staunch um, statement of disagreement with him, and that's the main thing that we're going to be discussing today. So, what do we prioritize? Do we prioritize orthodoxy, getting the right beliefs? Or should we prioritize unity? That's the question at hand. That's the debate that these two great theologians of the 1960s had. Again, people far smarter than us. And there's a lot of context to go into this that we're going to be really discussing, but I want to focus around their conversation and their disagreement, even though it was Anglican. I'm not Anglican. Probably a lot of the people watching and listening aren't Anglican. But I think this issue is extremely relevant, um, not just for today, but really for all time. It's just an important thing for people who are in the church to think about. So let's start with some, some of the personal stuff, some of how this might or might not relate to all of us. Most people who I know have been in the church for any period of time or who just exist, all humans have been in some kind of position where you're not sure, should I stay or should I go now? As the song goes, right? The question is, if you're in a relationship, is it worth trying to save the relationship to work harder on it? Or is it a toxic relationship that you need to get out of? Same thing can be true with the church, right? Are you in a church environment that's toxic, that's harmful to you that you need to get out of? Or are you placed in a church that actually needs your help, needs you to speak life into it to kind of help reform what's going on there? The same thing, religion, our worship, our relationships, our churches, our even some of our political groups, you know, um, just to be candid with everybody, you know, I, I grew up Republican. I'm mostly voted Republican until more recently. And now I'm, I'm faced with that, like this decision of, yeah, I don't recognize this party anymore. I actually think now it's mostly from my perspective, making bad decisions. So it's, do I switch to a side I don't agree with just because this side is bad now, or do I try and fix it? Or what pool do I actually have to fix it? Is it even worth trying to reform or would it be better to just start over? That's the question the church has faced several times over in the last couple thousands of years. And that's a question we're going to be looking at deeply. And hopefully we can take it just outside of the, just the church. Um, I think it is important. A lot of people are facing some kind of deconstruction or we face these um, conundrums of, do I still belong in this church? This church teaches X, Y, Z. Um, I don't think I believe that anymore. Or maybe the church changed stances. You agreed with the church and then one day... It changed a belief. I know someone who um who goes to a church who he does not believe in remarrying if your spouse passes away or anything like that. And the church has always taught that that's not okay. And then they changed. He stepped down from a position of leadership, but stayed in that church. And there is just this question of what do you do when you grow up in a place and you have ownership and that's your community. That is like part of your identity is with that group. And all of a sudden it doesn't believe the same things as you either because your beliefs have changed or because the organization has changed, I don't think it makes it any easier. You're still faced with this question of what do I do? Should I stay or should I go? Should I try to start over with something new? Should I try to reform what I've always been a part of? Man, that's a hard question, right? It doesn't get easier. Um, 
a lot of the evangelical deconstruction movement right now is misunderstood. Um, a lot of people think of it as, oh, we're questioning our beliefs in God and we're seeing the falsehood and people are leaving. No, it's not about people leaving their religion. It's people questioning doctrines that they were taught. And a lot of the times realizing they don't believe those doctrines, but they still believe in Jesus. They still believe in Christianity in some way and figuring out where their identity lies now and what group they want to be a part of now. And that, that's an important thing to do. Like, it's not something we can just discard. Oh, no, no one should do that and belittle that. Um, I mean, a lot of people, I don't want to name names on this show, but a lot of people have been belittling deconstruction, or acting like it's the enemy. That's exactly what Jesus did when he came, right? He questioned all the doctrines of the Pharisees. He questioned all of these practices that they've been doing that would keep them from sinning and keep them righteous. Jesus deconstructed the faith for a lot of people. And when we go through the traditions that I am as a Lutheran or Pentecostal Lutheran, you know, part of the Reformation is part of my identity. The Reformation was just wide scale deconstruction. So I have to wrestle with deconstruction being an important part of how I come to the beliefs I have and how the communities that I identify with have come to these beliefs. But also it is something that's going to leave some people to leave the communities I'm a part of now and start new things. And maybe they're right. Maybe they're not. It's an important thing to work with. Um, what are these things? Like, I, I don't want to just walk around. I, I want to address some of this stuff head on. Um, a lot of the things in the church today have to do with leaders who are doing terrible things like sexual conduct that's inappropriate, who are abusing people in their care, their spiritual abuse, emotional abuse, all kinds of things going on that's absolutely horrid. And no one should want to be a part of that. Like, actually, no one should want to be a part of that. It's truly too difficult. I get it. Frustrations go beyond that. You have a lot of churches participating in like Christian nationalism and getting up and supporting presidents and political leaders who have gone up and said things that are just blatantly unchristian, whose conduct is such that if you read the Old Testament, those are the kind of kings that God straight up killed. So you're addressing, do I believe in a God that kills? Do I believe in a God who doesn't believe in this person I like? Or if you're on the other side, you're going, Wait a minute, why is my community, all this church around me, suddenly supporting these people that the Bible plainly would never support? Yeah, yeah, that's hard, right? Should you stay or should you go? Should you try to reform or should you try to start over? That's the question. It's a question, you know, I'm talking about big scale things that are happening now, but even smaller scales. You know, I know people in my family who they grew up in a certain place and, you know, all of a sudden the church started acting different or the Pastors started just preaching differently and they just didn't like it as much. They were uncomfortable or their friends went to another church. And then it's a question of, should I go where my friends go? Do I just want to follow them? Should I start over? Should I stay in this church? Try to make it my own now? Um, if you have family and you go to your parents' church and all of a sudden your parents go somewhere else or your parents pass away, what do you do? Do you stay? Do you try to make it your own? Do you go somewhere else? Start over. These questions are hard ones and they're ones that were, it's necessary to address, I think. And there's a lot of different answers from both sides throughout all of history. That's not going to help at all. And I do apologize. This is not the show to come for answers that clear that are going to be helpful. But if you just want more questions and to think deeper about this thing and maybe some tools that will help you contemplate where you stand on some of this or what you should do in your own circumstance, maybe some of this will help. So from the time of the actual Bible all the way to the Great Schism of 1054, all the way to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, and then to the great ecumenical movements of the 1960s, and to today, we keep seeing this, where the church is faced with these impossible situations of doctrine, where we're either going to have to split, kick some people out, or just start over. When we think about the, the Great Schism of 1054, it came down to an understanding of the Trinity, an understanding of who is God. The Bible said, or the, the Nicene Creed said that God sent the Holy Spirit. And then later it was changed to God and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. So you have this question of, is part of the role of the Son, part of the role of that Trinity also a sender? Are we recreating the Trinity? Are we recreating these personalities? Are we misunderstanding what's going on here? What's the deal? An understanding fundamentally of God is what it took for the first split of the church. A thousand years after Jesus? A thousand? Why did it take that long? Early church, it, the big sin, and, the, and we're, we're talking about this more later on, but this keeps happening where the, the church kind of harps on something. Right now, a lot of times you're going to see it being sexual sin. Um, it's going to be 
you shouldn't be watching porn. You shouldn't be LGBTQ. You know, all this stuff is that that's the things that a lot of the mainstream conservative church in the news, that's going to be the things you see them say over and over and over. These are things they're concerned about. It's the thing that the pastors are falling to. That's the big thing right now. Early church, it was unity. The biggest thing you could commit is to break unity with the church. To So, of course, it took a very long time to get schism because they followed very clearly that part where Jesus said that his followers should be one. That was his prayer to God, the same way that him and God are one. And they really prioritize that unity, that church closeness, the Catholic universal church, part of the actual creed was unity. Yeah, it took a really long time and it took a, a disagreement about the fundamental doctrine of who is God that first split to happen. We're going to talk more about that here, here in a minute, but I, I want to get to, well, actually, let's, let's go ahead. Let's break down some of the other, the Protestant Reformation. You know, it, it comes down to, again, the next split when we're talking about like the, the 1500s, the the question wasn't doctrine that time, but rather it was um, actually practice. So there's orthodoxy, the correct belief, and there's orthopraxy, correct practice. And the problem was a lot of these reformers, yes, there was doctrinal issues. That did end up becoming part of it. But really the thing that kicked it off was seeing examples of leaders using penance, using different things to subjugate people under them, to use the church as a power of control and to keep the wealthy wealthy and the powerful powerful. And when people, the reformers started coming up and seeing this and seeing that that's not what the Bible supports and trying to teach other people to read the Bible, that's when you start seeing the Protestant Reformation and this other split. And what happens at that split, there's a warning from the Catholic Church that if you do that, there will be many more splits, many more factions of the church within it, and you will never be able to have a central power and control again. And that is that is a lot of what we see. You know, you'll see First Baptist, you'll see Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, Assemblies of God. Um, well, you have three different Methodist Church, two different Anglican or Episcopalian. Like, just in one city, you will see it. There's a lot of different churches, and it's because of this. It's because we did have that Protestant Reformation where we saw a great evil split and started new. And now there's just more and more splits, more and more new and new and new. That didn't happen until after the 1500s. So one and a half thousand years after Jesus. So when that finally started happening, then in the 1960s, after World War II, we saw the great evils of the world. We see all of these things fall. Um, in, in Europe, there was a, a great movement towards ecumenical work, towards different organizations and churches coming together as the church of God, not to do away with their denomination, do away with the factions, but rather to come together as one singular people of God. That's what we see in the 1960s, and that's where we're going to focus today, because that's where a lot of these arguments come back up in a way that I think is still very relevant today. So we're talking about practical theology. I'm just kind of seeing in my own life the time that I've faced stuff like this. You know, I, I've had times where I realized my beliefs was wildly different than the place I was at, or that the practices, the place I was at was something I wasn't okay with anymore, or um, the people there, the people I just couldn't be around anymore. And I've made different decisions each time. You know, I've made decisions to stay at a place where there were a lot of people I didn't get along with who were toxic to me because I thought I could do a lot of help at that church. I don't know if I made the right choice there or not. I'm just telling you what I decided. Um, and, I, and I stuck with that. And I, and I think I did do a lot of good. But also, yeah, I went through a lot of harm being around those people. I had doctrinal issues that I, uh, I expressed to the leadership and they still wanted me to work there. So I continued to work. Despite some major disagreements, you know, I would disagree about things like, do all believers speak in tongues? You know, um, I had disagreements about LGBT, what is marriage? Um, a lot of the things that I disagreed with, I made clear with leadership. And I still was able to work with the church through some of those disagreements and continue to do good, I think. For me, the big one was um, practice. When the people I worked with and the people that I did church with, community with, however you want to word it, I saw lying and cheating people in the community. That to me was a point where I, I couldn't keep working where I was. I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. Um, I stayed with the church after that. I just, I wasn't working with them. And eventually I started feeling called different places that I thought I could do more good in my own community, closer to home. You know, I was traveling to go to church at a place that I was no longer comfortable working with. So it was kind of a double-edged sword there. I ended up deciding to move and um, that's where I'm at now, where I'm, did end up kind of starting over, figuring out where is my church now? Who is my community now? And um, this little journey, can't tell you how that turned out for me yet, but um, it's hard. Um, I don't think it's as hard as staying somewhere that's 
harmful or staying somewhere that disagrees with you theologically, I think that's probably harder. That doesn't make one right or wrong necessarily. I'm just letting you know my experiences here. And um, it definitely paints some biases. I think if I was just going off of my own experience, because I do believe in God embodies all believers in these in our hearts I, I would say stay as long as the spirit allows you to stay and if the spirit pulls you don't stay past that if that doesn't make any sense to you just remember i did grow up pentecostal and i'm just kind of coming from that background a little bit of just i think the spirit will let you know when to go and if he doesn't let you know when to if he doesn't know, let you know when to leave unity should be prioritized the best that you can just my opinion um I know even for myself, I had a time where when I was preaching, I was preaching stuff that was not controversial, but stuff that I thought was against the common grain. The, I was going against the grain and I was going against the grain because I was angry at the church. I was angry at God for a lot of different things. And I was kind of pushing against it going, no, well, let's challenge all these beliefs. And I was doing that while preaching at the church that disagreed with me on some of those things, or maybe not disagreed with me or just didn't see exactly. That. Maybe that's a better way of wording it. So I dealt with that. Um, I even, I even had written and said some things in the past of we got to start over. All this stuff is wrong. This is all stupid. It's evil. And I called it all kinds of names. I was doing some name calling. I was calling for a restart. And then God kind of stopped me in my tracks a little while. And I was able to not do ministry for a time. And just kind of observe what was going on around me and everything. That's when I realized unity actually is what needs to happen. Not starting over again and creating a new faction and this time we'll get it right. But rather let's start bringing people together. Let's start showing humility, realizing that people from all these different factions know more than me are closer to God for me. A lot of them, if we come together, we might have a stronger church that actually is a little more sound in doctrine, a little better in practice and is able to do more in our community. So that's sort of where I'm at. It's why I started the other podcast I'm a part of the whole church podcast. We're all about church unity for that reason. So those are my experiences. Now let's go to the Bible. I mentioned there's places in the Bible that kind of seems like it falls in different places here. In Acts 15, you'll see that Paul parts ways from one of his followers, Barnabas, and decides not to do ministry together anymore. And it seems like it was more or less just fundamental disagreements on how they should be doing church, ecclesiology kind of stuff. And they respectfully split ways and continue to both do ministry and support one another from afar. You also see that part again. Jesus prayed that his followers would be one the same way that him and the Father are one. If we're going to believe that Jesus literally is God, that's some some that's some oneness that he's calling us to, right? We see in 1 Corinthians 5.13, where Paul tells people to expel other believers out of the church. Um, he, he's saying that we are not necessarily here to judge those around us. We can't tell them what to do. But within our church, if we see people doing some of these evil things, we should expel them from our community. You know, you just, you keep seeing place and place again throughout the Bible where God says, take this, start over, come up through. And then you see places where God brings people back in. I mean, even in the Old Testament, you know, he splits Israel off of everyone else. And then he gives people ways to become part of the community of Israel, even if they weren't born an Israelite. So it seems like both of these things are important to God, both the idea of unity and us coming together and also Splitting off those who are in wrong actions, splitting off those who are teaching false teachings, you know, all of those things are also important to God in some way. So you kind of have to find a balance because the Bible says both of these things. And sometimes it's hard because you can't do both every time. So who is the church or who is God's people? You know, I mentioned that um, the Israelites kind of analogy there. Um, you get you could get into this conversation about dispensationalism versus covenant theology here. I won't get too much into it, but for those who don't know, dispensationalism is kind of saying that the church kind of took the place of Israel when it comes to the prophetic writings of God's people, all that stuff. Um, covenant theology is the idea that that covenant exists with Israel and also new covenants exist with God's people. And it's kind of a continuation rather than a dispensation. Sure, we'll go with that. Um, and when we think of like, who is the church, who God's calling us to, what does it mean to be one? What does it mean to be in community? What does it mean for all of these things that we're thinking about proper theology? And we understand the Trinity, the way that we discussed it a few episodes ago, we understand that's talking about true oneness in the church and that the only way that seems possible just because of our understanding of who, who man is and what sin is would be by the spirit itself intervening. And if we believe the spirit can do that, we believe that we should rely on the spirit to do that. So 
when we're following our theology and we're logically concluding what the Bible says and where we should believe, we should believe, my opinion, unity is possible only through the Holy Spirit and not of ourselves, and thus we should rely on the Holy Spirit for unity and then try to see it happen. Not of our own will and of our own abilities, but of God's will and his ability, we reach out and trust the Spirit to allow that unity to take place. So now we can get to the history, get to the, the stuff that you came here for, where we're going to talk about Martin Lloyd-Jones and other people. But first, again, I want to remind you, the Catholic Church warned that we would have these factions if we didn't have a central authority. The Catholic Church believes that the Pope is the central authority of the Church, and that all the other authorities kind of fall under him. They have like a hierarchical system. They believe that Jesus appointed Peter as the first Pope, and then, you know, laying on of hands, bishops just keep going on and on and on. Peter and the disciples laid hands on some apostles. They laid hands on people, and there's a direct line of apostleship. It's an important doctrine to the Catholic Church, and that's where they warned the Reformers, if you split from this, there'll be endless factions, because you won't have that line anymore. Some churches still do. Um, I believe Lutherans. I'm not sure. I know the Episcopal Church, and I know that the Orthodox Church also still have that direct lineage where they can see Peter laid hands on him, who laid on hands on him, who laid hands on him, all the way down to their bishops today. So it does exist. and But the factions that they warned us about also exist. So are the Catholics right? They were right that there was factions. That doesn't mean they were right that we shouldn't have split from bad action and bad doctrine. That is something I think we still need to think about it and consider today when we're thinking where we prioritize unity and where we prioritize orthodoxy and how far is too far. Or, um, you know, for me, I can't just stand by a bad action. But unity has to be prioritized. But so does righteousness, so does holiness, so does the the church has to be the body of Christ and represent Jesus today. And what that looks like is, I, you know, I don't know. We're going to talk about Martin Lloyd-Jones now. We're going to move forward a little bit. He was an English doctor you know, in England. Um, he became a minister who taught against the ideas of liberalism, which is a, a lot of the, the Christian, doc, Christian doctrines that are more reliant on science and human philosophies and stuff that accept those things and the Bible. He taught against that kind of saying, nope, we don't need the things, we just need the Bible. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was also known for promoting the charismatic movement. He was a big proponent of, you know, this the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit. However, he did say that he didn't believe the gifts of the tongues were currently active and that when people were doing that, they were usually more a psychological condition than anything. Um, but he also would say that he, that doesn't mean he didn't think it was possible today. So some interesting stuff. We're talking about tongues and all of the other things that he stood for. Primarily, I think he was um, just known for being anti-liberal doctrines. Then we have John Stott. Man, that's a happy looking guy. Anyway, John Stott, he was raised by a, his mother was Lutheran. His father was atheist. Um, he was a very early made a leader in different ecumenical movements in the 1960s. You know, I mentioned that was happening a lot in the church in Europe, especially in the Anglican church. John Stott started and led several different ecumenical organizations, including the Church of England Evangelical Council, the CEEC, and the National Evangelical Anglican Congress. So he committed a lot of his life specifically to teaching about ecumenical church unity kind of work. That's actually part of why I wanted to have this conversation today is because this search for unity happened right after World War II because there was so much distraught and so much death in the world that they saw greater the need for unity in the church. Today, we're in a similar situation. Post-COVID-19, we've seen so much death, so much global tragedy. I hope again that we'll be reaching out for unity, and I think this is a perfect conversation to build off of for more of these conversations in the future. Then, in 1966, he holds the National Assembly of Evangelicals. So we started this off, we talked about how he invited Martin Lloyd-Jones to come speak. Now, no one should have been surprised. Martin Lloyd-Jones had been saying stuff about how we need to kind of depart, we need to go back and just start over, because, um, th but basically, the concern was that the Anglican Church was becoming too Anglican, too Christian nationalist. It was becoming too Roman Catholic, and it wasn't evangelical enough. And that Martin Louis Jones believed they should, the real evangelicals should leave the Anglican Church and start over a new evangelical kind of denomination, creating a new faction for the sake of having correct doctrine, denying all this liberal theology that's kind of making in, relying on the sciences and evolution, all these other things. Martin Lloyd-Jones was really concerned about all that stuff. 
So he really pushed for this, and he was pushing this before he was invited to this council. John Stott invited him, and to very few people's surprise, Martin Lloyd Jones said just that, that we should leave and just start over. But that still kind of shocked the world. It still kind of the fact that he actually went up there and said that at an ecumenical assembly. People were in awe. People were truly just shocked. So we're left here. He gives this big speech, tells everybody about why they need to start over, why they need to leave this false doctrine, these bad teachings. He's talking about 1 Corinthians 15. He's quoting the Bible, right? Then at the end, John Stott surprises people almost just as much because he takes to standing up. And the, the people who host these events never speak themselves. That's never really something that happened. I think this might be the first thing, the first time it happened. But John Stott addressed everyone after Martin Lloyd-Jones criticized Martin Lloyd-Jones, basically saying, calling him out for all of the things he said, saying, yeah, that's just not true. And then John Stott kind of makes his statement that Christ saw us. He didn't leave us. We need to stay because church unity is a fundamental part of what it means to be a Christian. We are not saved of the personal savior. We are saved into the church as part of God's people. And what that means is that we have to stick with God's people, even when it's at its hardest. And that's what John Stott believed. So Martin Lloyd-Jones, his biggest concern was that people might substitute unity, unity in the gospel for worldly unity, basically for looking like they're getting along, agreeing with some stuff, hanging out, watching the same movies and stuff. He was concerned they were going to just pass that as unity rather than having gospel unity, which is agreeing about the things of Jesus, agreeing about the things of doctrine. And if you can't agree on those things, your unity is worthless. But you're not having unity in Jesus. You're having unity in some other stuff, and you're ignoring the real questions. That's what Martin Lloyd-Jones kind of said. John Stott, he, again, he believed that unity is just what it meant to be a Christian was to be united with other Christians. You were saved into the church, not just personally saved, right? Um, he believed that Christian unity was more challenging than worldly union, unity. You had to find a way to agree to disagree, to work with one another, even when you had fundamental differences sometimes. Um, John Stott even said that unity in the church was something to strive towards with urgency. And he believed that because souls were on the line. And Jesus said they were going to see your love for one another, your unity, and that's how they will be saved. And if that's what Jesus said was our greatest testimony and we can't have unity, and how are we going to be able to lead people to Jesus? If that's what Jesus said was the way to lead people to Jesus, it's kind of hard to do. So they both have some really strong points here. And uh, yeah, it's not easy to say which one is right, right? Like, should they split from, and, and they both agree. They both agree that this liberal theology isn't right. They're both evangelical. Now, whether we are evangelical or not, I still think there's a lot to learn here. But they didn't agree on how to approach it, but they did agree on the doctrines that they were both talking about. The difference being that Lloyd-Jones said, the answer is to leave this church, start a new one with the correct beliefs. Whereas John Stott said, no, the answer is to stay here with people who have bad beliefs, with some bad practices, with stuff that might hold us back because unity is more important because unity is what will lead people to Jesus. And that was actually part of Martin Lloyd-Jones' point. He actually believed that it would be problematic to bring new people in to their community, to bring into unity if they had false doctrine. Because then, in your effort to bring people into right belief, you actually might be bringing them into something that you strongly disagree with. So that's another layer to this disagreement that's actually really interesting. They both quoted scripture. They both had solid points, strong points great logic behind what they said, but came to very, two very, very different conclusions. In the 1960s, so I mentioned the early church, the big thing they were concerned with was unity. If you, if you break unity, that was the big sin. In the 60s, the big sin was to have your doctrine wrong. They, you know, they were all about having correct doctrine at that point. Today, it's usually politics or sexual conduct. Something like that is the thing that we consider the big danger today in the church. The church always has something that it wants to harp on. The 60s, it was false doctrine. And John Stott stood up and said, no, unity is more important than that. So today, we might have people saying we need to branch off and we don't want a church that has any Republicans or Democrats in it, you know, whichever your side's on. Or we need to branch off to make sure we have a church that 
doesn't teach wrong things when it comes to LGBT or to this or that, or these things that we decided were the big issues. And the question is, should we start over with those things where we all disagree and just have churches that agree on those things that are separate from one another? Or is John Stott right? And would you say, even if they have bad belief and I disagree with them, unity is more important. Who's right? I don't know. Remember, I am just a dummy here to tell you how people have disagreed in the past and how we continue to disagree today. Yeah, we can agree on what we should believe about sexual issues, LGBTQ stuff, or politics. We certainly won't be able to agree on, if we did agree, how we should handle the people who disagree with us. And we still can't agree on unity, which, you know, if we can't agree on unity, it's pretty hard to have unity. So, that being said, as always, I like to have three takeaway questions for everybody. Today's three questions I want you all to take home sit with, ponder a little bit more as you think about Martin Lloyd-Jones, John Stott, the history of the church, all that. How do we prioritize church unity in our local churches today? In what ways are you prioritizing church unity in your local church? Question two, do I put a high enough weight on sound doctrine? Do I care enough that I have right beliefs and those in my church have right beliefs? Do I care enough? So outside of the what's more important, both of those things are important. And the question is, do I prioritize it and do I care about it enough, both with unity and with doctrine? Third question is, how could anyone tell when they should leave or when they should try to stay and make a change where they are? How do you know when it's time to go or when it's time to stay? So again, our three questions, how do I prioritize church unity in our local churches? Do I put a high enough weight on sound doctrine myself? How could anyone no, should they stay or should they go? Man, those are some hard questions to, to wrestle with. And we think about all the implications of our doctrine, what it means about our theology of God, the Trinity in relationship and in unity. When we think about a, what it means about our doctrine of man and humanity, where we come on these questions are going to impact a lot of our other beliefs. And it's going to impact our personal lives, not just in our churches, but in our other relationships. Figuring out when should I stay? When should I go? Guys, thank you all so much for joining this dummy on my journey to learn more about God and to love him better. I hope this has encouraged you to worship God in your own thinking and, of course, to keep on struggling. This was an Anadal Ministries podcast. If you'd like to check out other shows like this, be sure to subscribe to the network.